So President Biden's relief plan contains some major economic features, including $1,400 cash payments, extended unemployment benefits, and $350 billion to state and local governments. But is it, as the Dems and some of the media claim, a groundbreaking bill that signals Democrats' ideological shift to the left? In his latest piece, Matt Carp argues, no, the bill does not live up to that reputation. Here to explain why, friend of the show, contributing editor Jackman, Matt Carp himself. Good to see you, Matt. Thanks for joining us, man. Hey, happy to be here with you guys. So lay out, uh, lay out what you talk about in this piece in terms of media representations and reality. Well, yeah, I mean, basically, it's a two step argument here. I mean, I do think it's important for for us. And when I say us, you know, the left, I, I'm happy to speak for, you know, the entire half of the <laughs> political spectrum here. But sure I think it's I think it's important to, to acknowledge. <laughs> I think it's important to acknowledge, you know, that there are some real different features about this bill that, you know, especially compared to the, you know, Obama stimulus, you know, that this in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a large sense, uh, I think uh, this country, not just the Democrats, but both parties, Parties, um, and in the you know the larger industrialized world has kind of escaped in some way from the age of austerity you know ten years ago you can see that in you know the the CARES Act that passed last year and its its uh, willingness to spend billions tri- rather trillions on relief um, and the polls that were broadly supportive of this spending you know never mind the deficit uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike. They just weren't there 10 years ago. Um, I think it's 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 a there's a new sort of macroeconomic common sense. It's not unique to the Democrats, but it is really significant. And I don't think we should be too um, you know um, uh, too prudish basically to, to to acknowledge that that's real and that's good, and to just and that sort of simply spouting you know neoliberal austerity, neoliberal. Mm-hmm. It, it's not really adequate to the task. Of, of, of seeing reality here. You know, there are indications in the infrastructure bill that may be coming down the pike that there's more of that. So that's real. We're in an age of, um, you know, I call it budgetary liberalism, and that's something different. Um, it's not like the Obama era. Um, it's, it, it, is, it is more muscular in that sense, and it can do more good. That said, there's a real difference between a one-year budget and a, you know, structural change. You right. know, the I'm a Bernie crat. I'm a 2016 Bernie crat. You know, we want $15 minimum hour, mi- minimum wage. We want um, uh, we want Medicare for all. We want deep changes in the labor law that allow the working class to actually organize and gain uh, claw back some power from this outrageous billionaire class that, that dominates our society and our economy. And not, th- this bill doesn't do any of that. And it specifically failed to do the minimum wage. And so, uh, you know, we have to confront that this that this advance also does not necessarily portend advances in those directions in that in the direction of structural change. So the two big pieces that really get held out on that structural change front are the child tax credit and the increased ACA subsidies. Um, which is less even than the, you know, moderate proposal that Biden ran on during his campaign of a public option. We don't hear about a public option anymore. Instead, they're paying for COBRA, which, by the way, is a giant health insurance giveaway. And they're upping the Obamacare subsidies, which legitimately is going to make health care a lot more affordable and give access to a lot more people. But again, isn't like a radical transformational shift. It's just upping the efficacy of the existing program. And the child tax credits were told, like, Well, we did it for a year, but we promise we're going to do it for longer. We really want to do it for longer. Um, What do you make of those arguments? Because I feel like that was just taken at face value by the media and a lot on the left that, oh, that's for sure going to get extended for more than the year. I mean, I think if if they try and it looks like they will try, that's going to be a gigantic battle and absolutely nothing is guaranteed. You probably would bet against the success of extending that significant program. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, what I would say from a from a media perspective, first off, um, it seems to me it, it, I, I thought the reactions were a little disproportionate in that they seem to be sort of congratulating, you know, even from a from a left liberal perspective, you know, leaving aside, you know, uh, you know, the Jacobin worldview, um, even from a from a sort of left liberal perspective, um, there seemed to be a lot of congratulations in advance. And I don't I mean, I, I think it was about the excitement that, you know, to, to sort of try to be sympathetic to this argument, it's that this shows that they are willing to maybe do this and that's enough. And we've had so little we've had such few scraps, you know, you know, given to us from the table that that that, that even the promise of, of of an actual, you know, permanent reform is is enough to sort of, you know, to to, to have a have a parade for for me. 
I want to see it. You know, I want to see that 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 actual you know change in the permanent tax code uh, for child allowance, which is significant, but also. You know, we're talking about a couple thousand dollars a year. It's 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 going to make a difference in child poverty, no question. If they pass it, let's not confuse that with you know the Bernie agenda. Obviously, you know, let's not confuse that with class power. Um, let's let's keep our eyes on the ball. I would say on the you know the 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 actual transformative agenda that we've been talking about for five years. And I don't know why we should you know sort of surrender that and eagerly embrace. All these other changes until until something has happened. Look, if they pass for me, if you want to know what my threshold is, if they pass the PRO Act, the organ the Labor Organizing Act, you know, um, that's when I'll I'll step back and say, you know, mea culpa, you know, whatever other Latin words you want me to say, you know, I I you know I f this one, I'm wrong, you know, but the Democrats can do this, but um, you know, I don't I don't I don't I don't think. These budgetary changes are adequate to the to the to the to the case, really. I think this is a very important point, and you get to something important too, which is that the media doesn't really know how to discuss a lot of this because they either haven't been alive or they're not actually all that interested in policy. Which is that there is, you know, there is a difference between funding something for a year, or yes, learning, you know, the very marginal lessons of an 09 stimulus and the current stimulus, as opposed to something which is like totally and radically different in politics. I guess the question is, is how do you force that conversation? Because from my perspective, I've noticed that people have been so, I wouldn't say downtrodden, people have been so conditioned to a marginal improvement in your life actually does lead to outsized political benefit. Trump is a perfect example of this. A lot of people voted for him because they thought the economy was better. And look, it was. I mean, if compared to previously, 2% or 3%, whatever, increase in wage, tight labor market, but not even close to some of the stuff that he talked about. And yet he still reaped the political reward. So how do you break that dynamic? Well, you know, that's true. I mean, if, I, I mean, I guess in that sense, I'm, I'm not so, that, that's not such a scary prospect, uh, Sagar, for me. Because, you know, if it's true that, 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 that the Biden stimulus and, and maybe some fragment of this infrastructure bill that they can pass and, and maybe the child tax credits, even if they don't get any of the structural features and I still get to, you know, uh, you know, we still get to be dunking on the Democrats and they, you know, they haven't done the things that really would count as a transformational change. But I guess their argument is, you know, if they deliver these even small material benefits, maybe that can win back some of these working class voters who've been, you know, running from the party, um, you know, like it's the medieval plague. And I'm, I'm, you know, that's that's, I guess, the, again, the most sympathetic theory of the case for what they're trying to do. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still skeptical of that, that 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 is going to be enough. But if if that actually happens, if you know the Biden economy hums and you know people are back at work and people are getting you know these small but significant material benefits and they and they thank Biden and you know uh, white workers, Latino workers, black workers who who you know have have dropped out of the Democratic coalition, kind of reboard that train. That would be a promising development in, in my view, um, you know, because I think the number one fear for me I I about the Democratic Party's trajectory is that it is shedding these voters and it doesn't seem to care that much about them in its cultural style, its affect, its, its, its sense of its own priorities, its kind of, you know, moralistic condemnation of, of, uh, 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 of political disagreement. I think I, 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 I fear that, that that won't be enough. But if, if your scenario comes to the past, Sagar, I think that would be, I don't know, I think that might be good. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Well, it would show that materialist politics actually matter. And so I guess, Matt, the other side of that equation is what do you make of the Republican um, approach during the Biden era? I mean, they didn't really try with the relief bill, which is wildly popular and has majority support e even among Republicans. They still vote in the same Reagan era ways and they still vote like deficit hawks, but that's clearly not like the red hot core of what Republicans are up to these days. Instead, they've gone all in on these different sort of token cultural issues. Do you think that that's effective in order to continue winning um, working class voters of all races into their coalition? Yeah, they're they're on the ropes. I think there's no there's no there's no there's no denying that. Like McConnell is, you know, he can muster his caucus. He's he can whip those votes, but. They didn't make that an existential fight. I think they're, and, and I don't think that they are going to be able to make, say, an infrastructure bill an existential fight either. Yeah. They're going to, yeah, they're going to try to talk about Dr. Seuss. And I think what they're going to try to do actually is make it about the voting rights bill. Um, and, 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 and I think they may have more success there because I think the Democrats feel equally passionately about that. 
And um, I think that might be their sort of best hope for an Armageddon type situation in the Senate that that that, you know, really challenges, you know, Biden's ability to pass things um, where they can you know, they can they have a chance at mustering some kind of popular support because, yeah, their economic policy is, is in the toilet. They don't they're confused internally um, and they have no direction um, externally. So. Yeah. I think, you know, to, to some extent, what they're hoping to do is to sort of wait this out and hope that the, you know, Biden energy stalls and that and that then, you know, they can sort of maybe deficit politics will return. You know, people, somebody like Mitch McConnell probably hopes they will. Um, and maybe austerity will come back. Um, you know, I, I, I think they don't really have a lot of good answers right now. I think that is that is true. And I think that's, you know, in, in a small way, also worth celebrating that the organizational Republican Party is 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 really lost right now to me that's not necessarily a bad thing yeah yeah it's an interesting point all right man thanks for joining us great really to see you matt it. thanks so much good seeing you guys coming up ryan Grimm is going to talk about the dems who are reeling in their support of medicare for all when rising returns <laughs> 